same as if everybody is me making a All by myself. Even still, anyway. Good phrase. Thank you, Rose. Thank you for that special song. Praise to the Lord. I remember when I come back from Kenya that you sang to me on the 18th. That same song. Morning, everyone. Morning, yes. Blessings to you. Your God has been good to us. Amen. We are alive, huh? Amen. He's taken care of us and kept us. Amen. And we need to give Him praise and thanks for all that He has done. All that He is doing for us. One or two things I want to share with you quickly before we go into today's message. You know we have a new youth pastor coming. Yes. It's not too far away, you know, the 1st of September. He'll be here and we'll be introducing him uh, throughout the district. And he's a youth pastor of the district, right? We want to make sure things work the way they should. Amen? I'm not hearing much. Folks are very quiet today. Amen. I'm not hearing much about the church building. I don't know if we have a lot, you know, sometimes when things aren't going the way we expect them to go. We kind of peter out, and I'm not hearing much, but I want that to be on the front burner. There's a building for, I think it's about five million, a church, somewhere here in the northeast. And five million is not much. You may think it's much, it's not only five people give a million each. If 10 people get 500,000 each, we have the church. We have more than 10 here. So, it's not much. And so we need, listen man, you're quiet. God is our Father. The cattle on a thousand hills are His. We need to have faith that He can provide that sanctuary for us. I know that we are going into an evangelistic campaign uh, on the 18th, is the 18th, is the day? Come the 18th of next month, which is just about two, a little over two weeks away. But we need to be ready. You know, Pastor Wright is the speaker, and it's his first evangelistic campaign, so we need to take care of him. You know, and help him the best way we can. I promise him that I'll be the Bible worker in the uh, evangelistic series. And so, but we need to do our part as a church. And we need to make sure that things go well. Now, I'll be away for, for two weeks. I leave on Wednesday for Nairobi. I'm going to do a camp meeting there. And I'll be back on the 14th. So pray for me. God will work through me to bless His people. Evangel living. My God, yes. Change the sermon around a little. On the same team, but trying to give you a, a different slant. Let us bow our heads. <clears throat> Loving Father, we come to you at this time recognizing that you are God. We open your word knowing that it is your word. We ask that you will be with us now. Fill us today so that you can use us, we pray. 
In Jesus' name. I want to speak today on how to be a disciple. We are disciples, you know. Or we should be. I'm not sure that the Cornerstone Church all of us are doing all that we can, doing all that we ought to do. But we are Seventh-day Adventists, Christians. We have added to the church members, we have added to our church membership. We have baptized people. But Jesus did not really send us to baptize, you know. Jesus did not send us to add to the church while that is good and while we ought to do that. Jesus sent us to make disciples. This is the great commission, the gospel commission. If we look over here in Matthew 28, in your Bible, the last two verses of Matthew, Jesus didn't assign the precious gospel to some advertising company or some billboard company. He assigned his precious gospel to his disciples. He gave it to his disciples. How many disciples were there? Well, you say there were 12. Someone else said there was 120. Actually, Jesus was how many people in the world? Eight, seven point eight billion. The eight billion plus people living today to be disciples. That's how many people, you know, he was. Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. I checked with a, a, an expert Greek professor and asked, is it true that there is only one imperative in verse 19? And he said, yes, that's true. Do you know what the imperative is? It's the word make. Matensate is used, which means disciples ye. Make them disciples. Go as in going. Go is not an imperative. We are implored to make disciples. Now, what is a disciple? He is a learner. He is a, a pupil. There are four characteristics of a true disciple. One, he is more than a follower. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, we find another command. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. That's a command, isn't it? You might say the 12 disciples were, disciples were followers of Jesus. But they were much more than followers. That would only be partly true. Somebody asked a professor about a young man. I hear he is one of your students, they said. The teacher answered devastatingly, he is not one of my students. He may have attended my lectures. But he is not a student of mine. There is a world of difference between attending lectures and being a student. It is one of the supreme handicaps of the church that in the church there are many so distant. There are so many distant followers of Jesus and so few real disciples of Jesus. Jesus wants us to be disciples, not admirers. 
An admirer is a cheap edition of a disciple. An, an admirer stands along the path applauding. A disciple steps into the path and follows and takes up the work of Jesus Christ. An admirer sits in the pew and enjoy. A disciple labors to fill the pew by doing the work of Jesus Christ. There is one church office that each of us holds, and that is disciple. We are called to be disciples. Then a disciple will be like his master. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 25. It is not enough for the student or the disciple to be like his teacher. The disciple should be like his teacher, like his master. I read in Isaiah pages, page 827. Christ is sitting for his portrait in every disciple. You got that? If all you do is sit in the seat, in the pew and listen, you have missed true discipleship. Your goal is to be like your teacher. What you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. What you have made of yourself, that is true discipleship. Then a disciple shares in the work of Jesus. Matthew 11, 29, here's something we, we, we don't often like to have. He says, take, up, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Do you have a yoke? What is a yoke? How many people, how many of you think a yoke is a heavy burden? Huh? Really? It's not a heavy burden. A yoke is a wooden frame worn around the neck of a, 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 of a strong farm animal. It is not a burden to that animal. The animal has much more strength. It's just the opposite to the animal. A yoke makes the load lighter. If you were to hook up a heavy ox, a heavy load rather, on an ox, without a yoke, it would be unbearable for that animal. The plow chain would cut into the hide of the animal. It would make him choke. A yoke is designed to eliminate that pain, not cause pain. So when Jesus says, take up my yoke upon you, it is something good. It's designed to eliminate, eliminate pain and not cause pain. A yoke is just the opposite of an instrument of torture. In fact, a yoke is an instrument of mercy given to us by Jesus our Savior. A yoke makes the work lighter. And we must never speak of the yoke of Jesus in a negative term. A yoke, the yoke is your job description. No, it, if you habitually refuse church office, for instance, you may be on your way out the church. You're refusing the yoke. Jesus came by 12 fishermen and he called every one of them to leave their fishing poles and become fishers of men. If you are currently unemployed in the church, in a church office, or your Christian work, then you are not a disciple. When the church nominated committee calls, say yes, volunteer for something, take up your yoke, then a disciple is totally committed to Jesus. Are you totally committed to Jesus? Wilbur Reese hits it on the, on the head when he wrote, 
I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or to snooze in the sunshine. You see, a lot of us want ecstasy, not transformation. We want the warmth of the womb and not the, the new birth. We want about a pound of eternal in a paper sack. A true disciple wants deep and total and rich experience with Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5 tells us, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And Luke 14 and verse 33 says, In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. Have you ever said to the Lord, you know, I almost was your person today. I thought what it would be like if Jesus had done the same thing to us. What if Jesus had said, I was almost born for you? Or I almost lived for you? Or I almost died for you? But I changed my mind. Almost is not enough. It takes total commitment. What would it have been like for him to say, ask and it will almost be given. Seek and you will almost find. Knock and it will almost be opened to you. Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will almost give you rest. He didn't do that, did he? Most Christianity, almost Christianity is void of discipleship. How many times have you played the game of being one of Jesus' almost disciples? I almost chose that office. They called me and said, would you be willing to do? I almost said yes. I didn't do it, but I came close. How many times have you prayed almost believing? Or how many times have you walked through your days as if he were almost risen? We must walk our walk. And we must walk our talk. It's time for us to be total Christians. Yes. A disciple is totally committed to Jesus. Yes. That commitment keeps you going when things get tough. In fact, when the going gets easy, you better check and see if you are going downhill. At one time, Daniel Webster was considered one of the greatest living American. He was an outstanding statesman, lawyer, orator, and leader of men. 25 national leaders attended a select banquet in his honor. One man at the banquet asked Mr. Webster, Sir, what is the greatest thought that ever entered your mind? Without hesitation, Webster replied, the greatest thought that ever entered my mind was the thought of my responsibility to God. As he spoke, he wept, excused himself from the banquet and went outside to get control of his emotions. When he returned, he talked for 30 minutes about man's responsibility to God. We disciples have an awesome responsibility to our Creator. Considering God's ultimate investment in us, what is He getting in return? Hopefully, more than my checking account, which 
nearly averages a third of, of 1% in interest. God wants all of me or none of me. You are, are you totally committed to Jesus? You know when Cortez landed in Veracruz in 1519 to begin his conquest of Mexico with a small force of 700 men, he purposely set fire to his fleet, his fleet of 11 ships. His men on shore, on the shore, watched their only means of retreat sinking to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. With no means of retreat, there was only one direction to move forward into Mexican interior to meet whatever might come their way. In paying the price for being Christ's disciples, you too must purposely destroy all avenues of retreat. You need to rid yourself of that thing that enables you to slip back into your bad habits and slip into sin. Get rid of that thing. Burn it up. Torch it. Resolve to pay whatever price is for being a follower of Jesus. Then a disciple pays the cost. What is the true cost? If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, it will cost you everything you have. Luke 18 and verse 22 tells us, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Did the rich young ruler did that? Did he do that? No. Would it have impoverished the young man? He would have been richer, wouldn't he? His treasure would have been in heaven instead of here. But he would have had treasure, treasure that could not be taken away. If you look at discipleship any other way, it never has cost any disciple anything to follow Jesus. To talk about cost when you are in love, when you are in love with someone, to talk about cost is an insult. When you give everything you have to follow Jesus, you have more than you've had before. Each Christian either bears a cross or a crown. Until we take up our cross, we will flaunt the crown. We want to wear the crown, but we demand that Jesus wear the cross. We want a clean gospel. If there is blood, we want him to, to, to do the bleeding. If there is pain, we want him to suffer. Thus, we never grow up and mature into strong spiritual giants. For most of us, we are spiritual dwarves. Unfortunately, we backslide into tiny, um, sterile spiritual dwarves, unable to reproduce more disciples. Jesus has many lovers of the heavenly crown but few bearers of his cross. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 tells us, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, Jesus carried a cross. Huh? He bore a cross for you. He died on a cross. But never once did he say, my cross. Every time he speaks of a cross, he says, your cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus has many desires of exaltation, 
perfume of tribulation. He found many companions at his table, but few are followers of his abstinence. Many want to share with Jesus at the breaking of bread, but few at the drinking of the cup. Many reverence his uh, miracles, but detest the times of his silence. Many love Jesus so long as no adversities befall them. Many bless him so long as they receive blessings from him. But a, a, a disciple is a follower, is a servant. A disciple is a servant. Matthew 10, 25 tells us, it is not enough for a disciple that he be as his master and a servant as his Lord. We are to be servants, aren't we? We, we are to be like Jesus. We are to be servants of Jesus. There is very little blessings or reward in serving the Lord conveniently. You, you see, you see, modern worship in our time has been infiltrated by the tourism mindset. Worship is understood as a visit to an attractive, friendly location. If it isn't, we stay at home. It is to be made when we have adequate leisure. For some, it is a weekly jaunt to church. For others, there will be occasional visits to special services. We are becoming religious tourists. Some with a bent for Christian entertainment and sacred diversion will attend if, if there is celebration and there's a lot of hoopla and if there is entertainment. We are more unorthodox and the more unorthodox the better. They plan their lives around special events like retreats and conferences and so on. We will go to see a new personality, to hear a new truth, to get a new experience and so somehow expand our otherwise humdrum lives. We'll try anything new until something else comes along. Too many of us are fast becoming spiritual tourists at the religious strip mall of life. God, what God wants are hardened disciples willing to do the work of Jesus, to stay put rather than run away. Willing to roll up their sleeves and do the work of the Lord. A disciple is a willing servant. Wherever you are, you can do God's work. You don't have to go over there to be entertained. You can do His work right here. Then a true disciple abides in the Word. John 8, 31 says, if you hold on to my teachings, you are really my disciples. You are going to hold on to his teachings. You are going to know his teachings. You are going to read his teachings. You are going to saturate yourself with the word of God. A true disciple has a deep personal study time in the precious word of God. Its words are your soul vitamins. You know what vitamins are to you? It's your soul vitamin. A true disciple loves like Jesus loved. John 13, 25 says by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. If you love one another, then you know you are my disciples. If you can't stand saints, you might not be a disciple. If you can't stand sinners, you might not be a disciple. Let's be friendly and loving. You know, 
I almost wept when I got an email some time ago. You know, I got a lot of spam. I need to teach my computer worm to eat the spam. I did get an email that said, Pastor Horrell, I really enjoy your visit, my visit to your church. The preaching is great, the music is great, the Sabbath school is great. But what I found disheartening was the fact that nobody greeted us after church. That's just unfortunate. We want to be a friendly church. We want to love people, to speak up to a bunch of somebodies, let them know that they are welcome to stay. Share the love of Jesus with them. A true disciple loves as Jesus loved. Then a true disciple must be a much fruit. That's our last point today. John 15 and verse 8 says, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. A disciple bears fruit. A disciple make other disciples. It is not an option. It is a byproduct of being a disciple of Jesus. How do we make other disciples? John 15, 1 to 8 tells us, by being connected to the vine, like grapes. You know, there are a lot of uh, vineyards in, 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 in the province next to us, in the west. And they have grapes. How do, you, how do they get good grapes? They see the grapes connected to the vine. That's how you produce fruit. Much of our churches grow by osmosis. If we are not making more disciples, we are dying or dead. You are not one of Christ's disciples unless you are making some. That's the fruit of your ministry. Many of our churches have been in a spiritual coma. Some with no baptism. A church likes and needs a living will. Churches like that, that needs to have a living will. They need someone to pull the plug. Either prune the vine or root up the thing. Plant another one. We need to be making disciples for Jesus Christ. If you want to remain a full bread grip, Oswald Chambers said, you must keep out of God's hands for he will crush you. The liquid fruit of the vine cannot be had any other way. Put yourself in God's hands, he might crush you, but the result would be wonderful. You see, salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything we have. Billy Graham said that. Are you a disciple? Or are you a king? Are you a freeloader? Or are you a spiritual hitchhiker? You need, we need to be disciples. When we are disciples, we will give of our best to the Master. When we are disciples, we will give to the Master our very best. I pray that we all will be disciples of Jesus Christ. I pray that we all will heed His call, His command to us. Go in there. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. If we do that, then we are truly Christ's disciples.
Let us stand as we sing a closing hymn. Number 572. Give of your best to the Master.